All right. Welcome. Hello. My name is Idris Goodwin. He, him, his. I am broadcasting to you from Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, which is the unceded territory of the Ute and Arapaho and Cheyenne peoples. Um, this is a presentation of the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College, where I proudly serve as the director. Uh, tonight's program is part of our Arts and Social Action series, uh, which we started uh, some months ago. Uh, you know, in the first few months of the pandemic, um, we're utilizing the tremendous powers of uh, the social media, virtual and digital platforms to stay connected to audience, to expand our reach, um, and to really just have a conversation about uh, the arts um, and how they respond to our many pandemics uh, that we co currently find ourselves experiencing in the highly politicized um, atmosphere. Uh, and also a moment where, you know, we are in the, you know, continuing to uncover more and more and more thanks to living through the information age. And it's important to take those moments to stop and reflect on all the information that we are uncovering, that we are rethinking about and recontextualizing. All that and more ahead. Um, so this event is part two of our response to uh, the events of last week, um, the attack on the Capitol uh, in Washington, D.C., in addition to um, other government buildings that have been occurring. Um, I believe thoroughly, and, and I believe everyone at the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College agrees that um, it has always been the responsibility and the role of the arts to reflect, um, to bring people together, to galvanize and spark questions. Um, I'm joined tonight by two wonderful guests who I'm going to tell you about in a moment. Uh, but first, I, I want to talk a little bit on, you know, on this word sparks that I just used. I want to talk about three of the major sparks for the play The Raid, which if I haven't mentioned it yet, I wrote that play uh, many years ago. And it's uh, got produced in Chicago, got produced in D.C. Um, shout out um, Jackalope Theater in Chicago. Shout out Theater Alliance in D.C. slash Anacostia, which is where Frederick Douglass, uh, his his um, his rest is the home of his. Uh, how am I trying to say this? After he became a marshal, uh, after serving in, uh, in aiding in the Civil War, they they gave him a, a beautiful house on a hill in Anacostia, and he was able to look out and see the plantation in Maryland uh, where he was formerly enslaved. Um, and I got to spend some time there in his growler working on the play The Raid. Um, so um, I have three sparks to talk about really quickly about this play, The Raid. The first spark was uh, a very indirect spark, but it was a um, shout out Mr. Judge, my junior year high school teacher at Rochester Adams High School. Um, this may come as a huge shock to so many of you, uh, but I did not, I was not good at school. I was not good uh, at K through 12 school. I was great at college, but I was not good at K through 12 school. I really struggled. I, uh, I believe some of this is due to the undiagnosed um, learning disability. I, I think I was severely ADHD and we didn't really know what that was at the time. Really. Um, so anyway, enough about me and my stuff. Um, anyway, so uh, Mr. Judge, however, uh, made a light switch go off for me. Uh, he was a history teacher and uh, the way in which he taught history was sort of the beginnings of my understanding of what it meant to be a playwright, um, because what he he had this uncanny ability to, um, in the midst of the dates and the in the locations and the geography and all that stuff, he had this innate ability to drop us in the moment he was describing, and he wasn't like a big kind of Robin Williams flaily kind of kind of uh, teacher, but. He, he knew the right gestures to do. He knew the right way to stand. He knew the right subtle thing to do with his voice that took us into that moment. Um, and so that's where my interest in playwriting came from. And that's also where my interest in history came from. Um, so that's spark one. Spark two was um, I my wife was pregnant with our first son. Uh, and this was the summer where I moved to Colorado Springs for the first time uh, and back in uh, 2012. And uh, I was thinking just a lot about 
things that one thinks about when they're about to become a parent, you know, values, ethics, challenges, what it means, all that good stuff. And I said, I'm, you know, I've written a couple of plays about hip hop and young people and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I was like, I want to write something completely different. And so I'd always been fascinated by Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement. And uh, I, I had heard of John Brown, but I started really digging into his story and I found out that uh, shortly before his raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, him and Frederick Douglass had a secret meeting in a stone quarry in, in Pennsylvania, some, somewhere in the woods in Pennsylvania. So after I Googled what a stone quarry was, uh, I looked at the stone quarry and the stone quarry looked like um, the old uh, amphitheaters, you know, the old Greek amphitheaters. They had a similar kind of rounded, multi-level, multi-tiered um, look to them. And I said, that's a play, you know, about that meaning because no one knows what they talked about. Right. So that was the second spark. And then the final spark, um, you know, I, I think for, for this, for doing this event, you know, gathering uh, folks and um, putting it together quickly and trying to respond as quickly as we could uh, was one, one particular line in the play. And um, in 1840s, late 1840s, uh, a senator from Massachusetts, uh, Sumner, and a, seminar, uh, a, a senator from, I can't remember which state, but from a southern state, Brooks, um, had a fight um, in a government building after some speechifying. Um, and Brooks came into Sumner's office and uh, beat him with a cane. Um, and it was this vicious attack, you know, among these legislators. Um, and later in the play, Brown talks about that incident and says, and it sort of sparks him to go to Kansas and help his sons keep the border ruffians out um, and from turning Kansas into a, a slave state. So, you know, there was, it, that line hit me in the head um, that night, that Wednesday night of last week. And I just put a call out and said, I want to, I think we should just hear this play. And I think we should let other people hear this play and then we should talk about it. <laughs> um, Cause I'm old school like that. And, uh, and here we are. And now we're going to talk about it. If you've not seen the play yet, uh, it is going to continue to be available uh, on the fac.coloradocollege.edu website, um, and you'll be able to access it until tomorrow morning. So if you were stumbling upon this and you're like, what are these people talking about? Bear with us. Um, or if you want to set up a second screen and jump between the two, awesome. Uh, but our stage reading, our digital stage reading of the raid uh, is available uh until tomorrow but for now uh those of us who have seen it um uh, are gonna are gonna talk about it and uh, i'm gonna tell you about those people and bring them on in just a moment before i do really quickly i just must acknowledge the wonderful actors who um contributed their talents uh on the fly super last minute uh, for this. So I just want to shout out uh, Elliot Bales, who played John Brown, Cajardo Lindsay, who played Frederick Douglass, uh, Jeremy Redeen, Michael Crawford, Cindy Johnson, Jen Jarnigan, Rich Brown, and Michael Sazanoff. Also shout out uh, Kate Fernandi and Morgan Gatz and our production management and, and the whole team at the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center who sprang into action with yet another one of my crazy ideas. All right, let's meet our special guest. The first person I'm going to introduce, um, I was lucky enough to um, have as, as our, a last minute <laughs> director uh, of uh, the digital stage reading The Raid. Um, her name is Tiffany Nicole Green. She is a director and the resident director of a little show, a little, a little scrappy show called Hamilton. Um, she is also a leader, creator, and aggressive explorer of the human condition as it relates to relationships and the injustices of this world. She holds an MFA in acting from Brown University Trinity Rep, where her hunger for a deeper involvement in story building began. While in graduate school, Tiffany began to cultivate the skills of a great director. She became a mad scientist in her pursuit of opportunities to observe, investigate, explore, and experiment with her newly defined artistry. Tiffany is a New York Times pick. Lincoln Center Directors Lab alum, Soho Directors Lab alum, two-time Drama League finalist, and a proud member of the SDC. If any of you don't know all those inside baseball terms, just know 
Those are all very, very fancy. And if you see Tiffany drink out of a cup tonight and put her pinky up, she deserves it because of those credits. Anyway, while Tiffany works on a great variety of genres and theaters across the nation, she is particularly dedicated to continued development of new works and new play development. Ladies and gentlemen, nice and loud for Tiffany Nicole Green. Next up. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. That was great. I'm just laughing. I love it. Good. Good. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we are also lucky enough to have. Um, I'm gonna interject a, a little quick personal uh, th th note inside of Julie Felice Dubner's bio. Julie Felice Dubner is a dramaturg, producer, consultant, and teacher. She has freelanced around the country and served as the associate director of the American Revolutions at Oregon Shakespeare Festival and as a re resident dramaturg of Actors Theater of Louisville and the Prince Music Theater. She was the production dramaturg for the premieres of The Copper Children by Karen Zacharias, the very talented Karen Zacharias, Between Two Knees by the very talented 1490 ones, Sweat by the very talented Lynn Nottage, Party People by the very talented Universes, and more. She also uh, was an invaluable brain that helped me with my little American revolutions at Oregon Shakespeare Festival show The Way the Mountain Moved, but enough about me. Anyway, she is the co-creator of Rock and Roll, the reunion tour, co-author of The Process of Dramaturgy, and a contributor to Diversity Inclusi Inclusion and Representation in Contemporary Dramaturgy, The Routledge Companion to Dramaturgy, Innovation in Five Acts, and other publications and podcasts. Julie has served on panels, Horton F Foot Prize, Playwright Center, just more fanciness is what I'm saying. More fanciness. Ladies and gentlemen, Julie Felice. Um, can I can I hire you to introduce me all the time? Just I like know. call me up and introduce me. <laughs> Yo, can I can I just tell you real quick? And I'll, I'll tell you real quick. So first of all, shout out uh, my homie Kevin Koval. Uh, for years, I did a lot of work in Chicago with my good friend Kevin Koval. Kevin Koval is like a Jedi master of introducing people. And I, and I said, someday I'm going to be good at introducing people. And so it gives me great joy because you guys are really, really talented people. And I'm really fortunate and lucky to know you and really fortunate and lucky that you all answered the call that we, you know, that was literally, you know, like, like a barely week, like a week ago. Um, and y'all are busy. Y'all are doing stuff. And so just grateful that that uh, we can be in conversation together. Um, real quick, tell the people where you're, you're broadcasting and beaming in from. Yes, I am beaming in from Dallas, Texas. I'm working on a show out here. So I'm in Dallas, Texas right now. Also the land of the Kickapoo and the Wichita people. And I am in Ashland, Oregon, uh, which is the land of the Tacoma, Lagawa, Shasta and Applegate River, Athabasca and Dakubatebe and also a bunch of confederated tribes which are still here and still uh, very well respected and tending the land. That is entirely what's up. Um, so, you know, I, so Tiffany, I've, you know, you, you have an obvious connection to, to the piece. You know, I just called you up and begged you to come direct it. Uh, uh, Julie Dubner, I just want you to know that, you know, the reason I, I thought of you when I, when I knew I wanted to have this conversation is, you know, one is obviously through our connection with working on uh, the play at, at Actors Theater, or I'm sorry, Actors Theater at Oregon uh, Shakespeare Festival. Um, but because of, you know, you've worked on all these American history plays, you know, and so I think, uh, but, but what's interesting about you is to know you you wouldn't, you don't come off like that. You, you, you know, when people think of like people who engage with history, you know, you're thinking of the, the talking head with the, with the patches on the elbows in the Kim Burns documentary, you know, and, uh, and you don't come off that way, you know? And so uh, I'm just curious, you know, if we could start kind of just talking about like history and theater and particularly American history and theater and that, that as a, as a, as a theatrical tradition really is, is, you know, people in the now talking about re reimagining the past. Um, so yeah, I just, I think that could be a really cool place for us to just begin as we talk about, you know, this, uh, history play. Yeah, no, I was thinking about that too, listening to you talk about your teacher, um, and actually, uh, with this play in particular, too, of just sort of the one of the things I love about history is that if you know your history, you can make a good guess about where you're going. And, you know, understanding your history can sort of explain not just your present, but also your future. And it doesn't mean that I, I am actually a firm believer that history doesn't repeat. It's just that people don't really learn very well. 
Um, and so I think telling stories is is such an important thing, right? Like to be able to look something in the face, especially these days, to be able to look something in the face and say, that's the way it was, is that the way we want it to be? And I think with um, with theater in particular and, and film and television as well, but I, I uh, but theater is, is what I know best, is the idea of actually bringing the ghosts into the room and bringing the ghosts to tell the story. And I think uh, it's one of the things I actually wanted to talk to you about with this play, you and Tiffany Nicole, of just sort of, one of the things I was fascinated when I read it um, just yesterday when you called me <laughs> was uh, the list of names and just how that insistence of making sure that we know, although we are looking at John Brown and we are looking at Harriet Tubman and certainly Frederick Douglass, but there were all these other people here and the creation of a character like Emperor to sort of be a guidepost, even though he's so quiet. Um, and I love the actor who played Emperor yes, in the reading, just even on a video screen, just beautiful grounding, right? Yeah, Michael Crawford is very special and a, and a, and a Colorado son. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I love that moment where the names get read, um, because I'm you know that's a very like you know sort of evoking the names, evoking the spirit, reading off the list, the litany, all of that. I always get a little chill because I whenever that part happens, and obviously I've heard this play a billion times. Whenever that part happens, though, I always think of those. I always feel like those people are in the room. You know, I like. I just feel like they're there and it gives me like a little chill every single time. Just those names are read. And then when they're read, again, like when Brown says them, he says the names. And then later we get the, you know, who died and who lived and spoiler alert, uh, uh, who died and who lived. And and that, that moment I've all, I've fought for many, many people have tried to get me to cut that part. And I'm like, nah, fam, sorry. Yeah. It's interesting because when I was like, you know, rushing to take, you know, we didn't have much time. So I was taking a lot of notes ahead of time and thinking like, what are the things that I wanna make sure we get and what's important? I definitely had notes around those names because I think that they are so, it's so important to have, to be grounded in um, individuality and specificity and personalizing. And when we got to that part, when Elliot said the names, I was like, oh, no notes, like, I feel that. I, and then when Michael came behind him and then spoke to what happened to those people, there was just so much detail and specificity that the actors brought, I think like the first time we read through, definitely the second time we read through. Um, and it's just, it's just a beautiful reminder that these are real people. And we, you know, I, I watched them see those different individuals and, you know, build relationships with nothing more than a name, you know, on a page when you first get it. So, yeah, yeah. it's important. Yeah, I was thinking too, uh, uh, I was thinking back to when I was in high school in the 80s and how I don't really know that I ever learned about Frederick Douglass. Uh, I grew up in on Long Island in New York, and I don't know that I was ever taught about Frederick Douglass until I got to college. We learned about Harriet Tubman, but certainly in sort of a a, a surface way, right? Of just sort of, you know, we knew she led the Underground Railroad, but I don't know that we actually were taught about the Underground Railroad and what this woman actually did. And I did learn about Jane, John Brown, but I, I almost said James Brown, but I'm gonna, back. <laughs> I, we did learn about John Brown, but it, we learned about him as sort of like, you know, just sort of a whack job, right? Like he's sort of taught like a crazy person instead of somebody who actually, acted with great purpose. And I was reading something yesterday about how uh, his Christianity was used against him, that it was, you know, that the idea of talking to God was used to say that he was, you know, sort of hearing voices and really sort of off kilter, when it was actually his faith was what gave him strength and his conversation with God was real for him. That was part of his faith. And I was wondering, you know, just sort of in terms of, it feels like we reevaluate John Brown every 20 years or so in American history, right? Like every generation has its own version. And I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about your introduction to John Brown. 
Uh, Tiffany, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't learn about John Brown that I can remember growing up. Um, very, like one quick mentioning of Frederick Douglass when I was in high school, and I'm from Texas, so I went to school in Houston, but I went to high school in Reno, Nevada. Um, and in either place, not much. Like you said, a little bit about Harriet Tubman, but you know, we learned about the Underground Railroad, but not the risk involved and not the danger and not all that she was up against. And so, yeah, when it comes to this idea of, uh, as I've grown to understand the, the, um, the ways in which they tried to, uh, you know, make him seem crazy, um, I, I was really drawn to what religion meant. I'm, I am sort of fascinated with like what religion means to different people and how we use religion um, as a way uh, to hold on or like as a, as a pillar of strength or, you know, th that religion comes to those who need it most, you know, it's that sort of thing. And so, you know, while sometimes even in the script, while sometimes there are things he says that seem extreme, it's like, oh no, this is what he needs. This is what's keeping him strong. This is his way of focusing, you know, this is his, um, how do we eliminate the distractions? How do we stay focused? How do we stay driven? And that was, uh, that that felt like his way. Um, and the task was huge. <laughs> so, you know, that requires a lot of strength, which can come across as, you know, being a bit crazy. And um, one, of the thing, one of the things I really love in the script is when Henry says uh, that, that he's not religious and the reason is why is because he doesn't know how to put that into God's hands. You know, that, that comment, um, it just rang so honest, so honest, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great, great point, y'all. I, um, uh, I one, one thing that just hit me too while you were talking, Julie, was because uh, I, 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 one of the things, you know, you watch these old plays, old for me, just meaning like I wrote them a few years ago and they've been through many iterations and there's a point where you just let go and you're like, this is what it is. But, you know, one of the things that I, always have felt mm, i'm gonna go back to that was that i want i wish harriet was more involved in the story i think i wish the female characters in general were more present in the story but um uh but definitely harriet and so i'm now working on another piece called a tribe called tubman which is a one-person show which is really um uh in, in investigating her life and and really the thing about it is there's so much we don't know because it was in secret <laughs> Like, like, you know, like Underground Railroad, there's so much, um, there's been a lot of efforts to uncover a lot of things, but there's still so much we don't know. And that was because it was in, it was supposed to be, you know, much like what sparked this play, which was that they had this secret meeting in Pennsylvania and they allegedly talked for many hours and that's kind of all we know. And so as a writer, I'm like, oh great, I get to make all that up and no one can tell me that a bounty hunter didn't pop up and try to capture them and Frederick not, you know, whatever. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that was, that's definitely something that I think is interesting. And I think we're going to continue to un unpack this stuff. I think more of this stuff is going to come to light. Um, on the faith piece, just taking a step back to the, to, to the faith piece that came up, um, the, the thing that was really almost sometimes overwhelming for me was the thought that this person John Brown was, was as Master P would say, was bought it, bought it. Like completely 100% connected to faith and taking all directives from his interpretation of it. That's a little, right? That's, that's intense, right? And most of us in this sort of so-called modern world, you know, we've kind of made this agreement to kind of have one toe in and one toe out, and that's just kind of what it is. But if you really look at these documents and these doctrines and you take them literally and you were full on in there, you could justify like, yeah, okay, I'm 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 going in. All I'm all I'm all in for this. And so it's it's a it's a certain kind of commitment that you almost have to admire in a way, you know, that 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 they can have that level of full faith. Um, and so that, you know, just working on it, like that the faith line wasn't something I anticipated, uh, but it just really kept coming up and it became really a, a very prescient theme. And even when I go back to the show, I'm just like, 
wow, it's a lot of religion in this show, you know. But it's like I gotta, I gotta honor, you know, what it, what it was, you know. Well, exactly. I mean, I, th I think you you can't avoid it. I was reading this this book, um, Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is a yeah. it's a I don't know if you guys know it, but it's a mm -hmm. it's a reevaluation of high school history textbooks mm -hmm. and just sort of the way uh, the way we've backed down from telling full stories and perhaps why, right? Of just sort of you know the question of. Uh, uh, of of why people acted the way they did and how each generation reinterprets it. And just going back to something you were just saying, <clears throat> and especially uh, just considering, you know, the kind of work that both of you have been doing for your careers, you know, part of what we do as artists is we do fill in that blank, right? We don't know what happened in the quarry and we don't know what this conversation was between Harriet Tubman and, and John Brown. Like these things were not recorded the way everything is recorded now. And I was just wondering um, if you guys could just talk a little bit about just sort of the responsibility of that, of just sort of, you know, I had this great teacher in college, this guy, Gerald Gill, um, who was the first person who taught me that um, there's a difference between truth and fact, right? And, and historians traffic in facts, whereas artists traffic in truth. And, um, and there's so much, especially in that conversation with Douglas, sort of the center heartbeat of this play that, um, that you have to invent or you have to channel that in some way and i was just wondering you know between this piece or other pieces that you two have worked on of just if you could just talk a little bit about that responsibility that's so interesting because i definitely um am all like my dedication is to the truth <laughs> all day and i hadn't really thought about it that way um or i hadn't put it into words um and i have the luxury of working with someone else's words so I am always dedicated to um, the words on the page. I'm dedicated to the story that uh, reaches me through those words that I hope will reach others through those words. Um, and I, um, I am very fascinated with sociology and psychology. That's sort of my way in. And so, um, you know, with my loyalty to the script and the playwright's words, and then therefore the characters on the page, and then therefore the mindsets of these characters and getting to know them and how they think and what makes them tick. And and um, I am, I think the truth lies in honoring all of their truths and the ways in which they conflict um, and, and speak to one another. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's really an interesting way of putting it. But I think I think that for me, that's where conflict comes from, right? That there are so many truths, and we have to honor them, and we can't tuck them away, and we have to expose them—the good, the bad, the ugly, um, the broken—and uh, and it helps. I hope that eventually it helps the people watching to um, either acknowledge someone else's truth or become a little more honest about their own. Um, yeah. yeah, and with, with the help of a great dramaturg to get some facts in there for me as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amen, long live the dramaturgs. Uh, that reminds me, I have, I have a two part, I have, I have, I'm gonna respond just really quickly to what we're talking about, because that's a big one, this uh, fact versus truth thing. But then also I, I have, don't let me forget my little, my little question for you, Julie. Um, uh, so this is a big one for me because I'm increasingly becoming much more sort of confident, uh, and, and intentional in how I like to approach quote unquote historical drama in the sense that like, I really, it, I'm, I'm going to say this is going to sound controversial. Uh, when I say I don't care about facts, let me, let me say that I do obviously care about facts. What I'm saying is that I don't think that the expectation for, for, from the dramatist don't come to me for fact. Like you, like there are better places you can get facts. Like you come for a story, yes. you know, my job is to tell a story, but also, I also think that history is also just storytelling, 
by a different type of story, like a non-dramatic story. And that's what Mr. Judge showed me. Mr. Judge somehow understood that I have to make these in the stories to make these like horny, crazy teenagers interested in this stuff. You know, I gotta, I gotta remix this history and hotten it up. <laughs> and he understood this fundamental thing about suspense. You know, it wasn't just like the war ended here. He's like, no, 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 no. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna take you on the start of the war. You know, he's thinking, he's like a showrunner. He's like, no, I'm not gonna get that till season five, you know. And so, um, yeah. And then, you know, the great Robert Shinkin, who, um, whose play Kentucky Cycle made me feel like I could even try to write a historical play. And there's a lot of things I ripped off from uh, Kentucky Cycle that are not in this play anymore because, like, the play used to be mad long and it got shrunk down and all that. But, uh, uh, but just I've I've heard him speak a lot about this balancing act, and I'm not going to misquote the wonderful man, but I will say that, you know, hearing him talk about, you know, for him it's 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 about the realm of if you do the research and you understand the world enough and you get the facts ingrained in you, you know, you you write within the realm of possibility, right? So like space aliens come down and take John Brown away and show him the future. That's that could kind of be dope. That's the getting into the speculative fiction, right? But they have a word for that, right? Speculative fiction, you know. So, um, you know, I just think it's something. But I have had estates. I have had estates of people say, you know, this, you know, this is not how it happened. And and, and if you do this, we're going to write an angry op-ed. And and then I just say, inspired by the life of, instead of it is the story of. Uh, so, okay, here's my here's my little uh, no. The John Brown estate, by the way, did not uh, get 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 mad about this play. Everyone's fine with this play. Um, Julie, here's my question for you. I just want to know. I just wonder quickly if you could just explain to folks who may not know, like, what is a dramaturg? Mm. Oh, quickly, uh, <laughs> we're magic. That's what we are. Um, uh, <laughs> When I used to teach dramaturgy, or I still do, but I haven't for a while, but uh, I used to call it the three C's, um, which was uh, content, context, and concept. And so we work with, uh, whether it be institutions or individual artists or projects on those three things. And so we have a responsibility to those three things, even though um, there's a question about authority over anything. Um, but what I do is, you know, like with a play like yours, I would sit down with you and we would talk about what is the actual concept for the play, right? Like in, in your biggest dream for it, what is the dream? And then my job is to work with you to make sure that all of your dreams come true. And the same thing with, with the director of just sort of like, what is the world that you are imagining that this play lives in and how do we make that possible? Um, I've also spent a lot of my career working as an institutional dramaturg, so working at different theaters. And so um, my job is also to dramaturg the institution. Are we, what is our val what is our value statement? What are our values? And are we living up them? And basically to be a pain in the ass, <laughs> um, which is uh, probably the thing I'm best at. Um, I, I, I would say too, um, you know, yes, we, we are the people too who work on, on sort of the context for things. One of the things I learned early in my career, and if there's any early career dramaturgs out there watching this, this is uh, uh, le learn, learn from my mistakes, um, of not being the history police, right? I think what, what you were just saying about if you do enough research, you do wind up internalizing it. And if you are somebody who loves history and loves reading about history and loves living in history enough, these people come to life for you in a way that they will rise off the page. And so to be able to say, I am honoring their story as opposed to giving you a list of dates. And I think the the best dramaturgs will come in and say, that's not the way it happened, but I but let's talk about why you're telling it this way. And to say, you know, again, like this is one of my favorite kinds of plays to be able to say, we don't know what happened here, but we can make really good, smart leaps of faith about who these people were in that quarry and what might they have talked about. Or more importantly, what were they, what do we hope they were talking about? What were they saying then that will speak to us now? You know, the, the, every play takes place in three times, right? Or every history play takes place in three times, right? The, the time that it's written, the time that it's set, and the time that you're doing it. 
And so even now, you know, the difference between 2021 and 2015 is so much vaster than anyone, you know, wanted to believe it could be, um, even if many of us are not surprised, right? And much less the fact that these are events that happened, you know, 160 years ago. And so what are, what are the things, why are you, why this play, why now? Mm -hmm. That was a very long answer, but I hope it was interesting. No, no, no. <laughs> and listen, you, and you landed the, the dismount perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, my cat has just appeared. So, uh, hey, so there, your there. Cat. <laughs> your cat. well, you brought up something really interesting that I actually wanted to ask you both. Um, you know, I've spoken on like why, I, I thought of this play, you know, I've written a bunch of plays, you know, and uh, and I'm like, but this one just 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 punched through the, the, the drywall and grabbed me by the shirt. I'm curious for you. And that's OK. You won't hurt my feelings if you if you disagree. But like, what do you you know, I guess here's my how I want to word this question without sounding pretentious. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, do you what 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 where did you see the now in this play, if if at all? Or did you, or did you not, or do you think actually, bro, it's actually not at all about now, uh, or whatever? I'm just curious, you know, just as the as the maker of as the writer of this thing, like, you know, um, uh, yeah, what what of the now and the then are you seeing, if at all? And even virtual listeners who've seen the show, I'm, I'd be curious to know that. I think I was struck when I first read it by something that um, is a bit of a flip. Uh, by comparison and, um, well, no, the first, the first thing is I was struck by the audacity and the privilege that gives you um, the strength and the will to form uh, your own army of people. And to and the belief in your abilities to overthrow um, the powers that be, um, and the the conflicting the conflicting ideas between John and Frederick, right? This um, the different uh, the ways in which Frederick said, "I can't actually fight that way. I have to find another way. I'm born into war." You know, like those sorts of, um, you know, those thoughts really reminded me of the ways in which, you know, we feel like we don't have that uh, power even today, um, and and we wouldn't. Yeah, I'll leave it there. That we don't have that power. And, um, but then again, I thought about the ways in which, uh, you know, like, what do you do, which is like the opposite of what I think we're saying today. Like, what do you do when your own government dehumanizes you? What do you do when you live in a land um, ruled by people who don't value you? Um, and, I think we are we're we're sitting on the other side of that, and we're sitting here and experiencing um, the the storm that is brewing as a um, as a as a response to the fact that that is true for us right now. Uh, but yeah, it, it just really called into question those things, and and. And then I started to think about the difference between, you know, the uprise and the rioting or the or the the forming of this army. Um, and what John basically what John Brown was writing, what, what John Brown was fighting for versus what the people who stormed the Capitol are fighting for, you know, so different. Um, so, yeah, those are those were sort of the things that percolated for me when I read it. And how interesting those uh the conflict right the conflict between the two because there's it's like well, okay but what's the reason why does that change anything does that does that make it okay to form your own army and try to um you know destroy 
the capital? It, like, is is your reason why sufficient, or or does it matter? And 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 what is worth fighting for, and what is belief? And then you bring religion back in, and so yeah, it just sort of took off for me from there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, if you if you are a student of history, thinking about John Brown uh, is a is a common thing in the last couple of weeks, uh, much less in the last week, of just what is. Um, I was a little afraid actually when you sent me a play about John Brown. <laughs> I was like, is he the right guy to be talking about right now? Like, and how how can we talk about him in a way that does differentiate? Yeah. You know, and I, was, I, I was emailing uh, with you two this afternoon and just talking about the difference between idealism and cynicism, right? And one of the things I think um, you capture really beautifully in the play is, is how idealistic both Douglas and John Brown are, that they, you know, they obviously have very different ideas about what is the, what is the thing that they can do or what is the thing that they should do next, right? And I think too, after, especially the last year, uh, you know, being trapped in my house, watching the world go by on my TV screen, you know, and, in, and interrogating what is my responsibility, especially as a white person, right? Of just like, that idea that he that he did use his privilege but didn't even understand his privilege john brown to be able to say i'm going to arm a bunch of black people <laughs> and change the world and how like that actually is a little bonkers right but is it wrong and in that what our responsibility to leave the world a better place for our friends and our family and our children like, what is that? Like, is it our responsibility to be, to have the big crazy idea? Maybe not to, you know, blow things up. Maybe that's not, you know, John Brown, when he's talking in the first scene in the Springfield about trying to find his purpose, like that hit me really hard, right? Of like, what is my place in this struggle? And how can I live up to that responsibility without getting a bunch of people killed, right? <laughs> yeah, like that's probably not my thing. I'm just a nice little dramaturg from Hop Hop Long Island, right? <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, today, today, that's today. that's like, she was just a dramaturg. Right. I think if you, if you do strive, right? Like if you do, if you do actually love the idea of this country, even as you stand in judgment of how it has not lived up to its promises, to put it lightly, but if you do love this country and you want it to live up to the ideals and the promises, like what is what is the right way forward? And, and in reading the play and watching the reading, it really made me reconsider that actually now is the perfect time to talk about John Brown because he stands in such stark contrast to what we have seen in the last four years, five years, 20 years, 400 years, one week, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you for saying that, both of you. Because, because you're right. I mean, I, I had the same thought too, but I don't know. I just I feel like what makes theater so, so unique is that it goes into the gray, it goes into the to, to the tensions, it goes into the complexity, and really, you know, for me, it's it's you know, it's Harriet Tubman, it's John Brown, it's Frederick, it's all these people who are on the same side. Right. There's only one character that shows up later. That's like slavery. Yay. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You know, and even he's just kind of an opportunist, you know? Um, and for me, I guess the fourth spark that I didn't talk about up top was, um, is, uh, that night, that same night, uh, Biden went on the air and was just like, this is not who we are. And I was like, really? <laughs> the upside that fell on my black ears. Like, Mm, but it just happened. Like it just happened. So is this not who we are? Cause it just happened. It kind of is like, we have to atone like for the millions of people, you know? And so for me, it just made me think of as a nation, like we, we like, you know, we had civil war and we just were very violent. You know, we're just a violent country. We're violent, very religious, very, strong in our beliefs, you know, just the themes of race and government and responsibility and God versus government and rights and all these things to me just felt 
it, it was thematically re- relevant, not so much like I'm saying, it's just like John Brown. You know, that's like the very shallow kind of reading of it. It's like, it's, it's not, but thematically it is. It's like, we're talking about the same, same stuff. And cause this is, this is kind of who we are and we change, but like at our core, we're still kind of, kind of, kind of suspended in, in these same kind of issues, you know? I'm rambling. So let's let's uh let's go to comments. We got a lot of comments over here. Let me let me look. Uh a couple things folks are saying that we're getting some shout-outs from the great Katie Grugenhagen, uh, who who has who also has Colorado ties and Houston ties. Great Ooh. lighting designer, Katie Grugenhagen. Uh Floyd Fernandez says he did not learn about Brown until after he received his bachelor's degree. Mm, mm, mm. Uh Marianne Aldrich says that coming from Canada, uh, that is fascinating to know how little it was taught. We were taught, albeit somewhat superficially, about Brown, Douglas, and Tubman in junior high and high school history and public school. Shout out our neighbors to the north right. for being Canada honest. showing us up again. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Floyd Fernandez again. I'm sad to say I didn't learn about the black community that was wiped out by the white mob. Talking about Tulsa, uh, till it was in HBO's Watchmen. Again, I remember that moment because I've known about Tulsa for a very forever. I've been to Tulsa a bunch of times. Uh, I don't know about you, Tiffany Nicole Green. Uh, yeah. Based on where you grew up, you probably heard about it, right? Yeah, I don't think I really. I think I like heard about it, but I learned about it in college. Yeah, but I remember when Watchmen happened, and just like everyone was just like, "Oh my God, did you yeah. know this happened?" And I was like, like, "Y'all didn't notice?" It. Yes, right. Well, because there's this. I mean, don't get me started. America's yeah. very good at. Uh, forcing a narrative down your throats. And, um, and we, we, we put a lot of energy into the image, the facade, rewriting history. Like, I think America puts a lot of um, energy and emphasis in that. And so I think there's a reason, there's a reason we don't learn about that. <laughs> yeah, it's by, de- by design, by yeah. design. Uh, Julie Fleece Dubner, did you know about the Black Wall Street, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma? I was really lucky. I didn't learn about it in high school at all. Um, it was, you know, we've lived all over the country now, and uh, it was one of the things you notice when you live in a bunch of different places is the different version of history that you learn wherever you grew up, right? So I grew up in New York, and I learned a lot about the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. And my partner grew up in Massachusetts, so he's like all pilgrims all the time. Yeah, you know, when I moved to Chicago. Uh, you know, it was it was all about the Industrial Revolution, right? That was like the kids who went to high school there learned about that. Mm-hmm. And then when I lived in Louisville, we learned about you know the the kids all there. <laughs> that's, depending on which neighborhood you were oh, in, right? <laughs> you learned you learned about the War of Northern Aggression, which was you know, and uh, and the Bourbon Trail. You know, in Philadelphia, it's you know all revolution all the time. Out here, it's you know it's changing slowly, but you know, the, my son is in junior high now and, and history is, you know, sort of a, the, the balancing act between how great the pioneers were and then also learning about the native Americans who were here before. Right. So, which was something I, I couldn't tell you who was on long Island before I got there. Right. It's like, but that's, you know, sort of the thing. I learned about Tulsa, that same professor, Gerald Gill, like he's passed away, but I hope that he's somewhere be happy to be acknowledged. But um, I was really lucky my freshman year in college to have a black history professor. And it was an American history class, but he was, I think, my first black teacher. And I didn't understand it then because I was just an 18 year old in 1987. So what the hell did I know? But to have that perspective be my first perspective of the real scholarly study of history was so lucky. And we that was on my syllabus. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that other people who took that same American history survey at other schools didn't get that class. And so just to, to shout out to the teachers again. Yeah, shout out history teacher show. Um, we got a real good question here, Rich, a very rich one. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of people today who are frustrated with the perceived inability of political advocacy or violent insurrection to mount wide structural change. The idealism of Brown and Douglas are incredibly inspiring and continue to reveal new lessons 
but do we need to dream of new ways to enact real change? How do you all dream of change? That is a good one. Yeah. William, Will Bates, let's go. <laughs> shout, shout out Will Bates for silencing the room for a second. <laughs> Can I, I'll, I'll just say real quick, just because I know. Uh, for me, I, I, I think for me, me, myself, like I sit in this seat, I do this job because I, I believe arts, it's through the arts. I believe that storytelling and story listening and creating spaces for, for that, for different walks of life to come together and hear stories and tell their stories and reflect on their own stories is how we get some change from, from this, you know, and it's all, it's hearts, minds and legislation. It takes all different, it's education, it's health, it's equity, it's, you know, neighborhoods and, and infrastructure, it's, it's all of it. But for where I sit, it's, it looks, it's this, it's this work we're doing right now. It's like, I'm going to put up this play and then we're going to talk about it. And then, you know, we're going to do study guides and then we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this, you know, so that, that's what it looks like for me. Yeah. Mine is similar. I mean, I was just talking about the facade and uh, I, I, in my work look to destroy it <laughs> at every opportunity um, just to shed light on, on the complexity of people and, and the, the, the things that we have, in common, not in a we are the world sort of way, but in the like, we are all broken sort of way. And um, we're all broken in different ways, but we hurt and bleed, you know, just the same. And so, you know, I, I do, I try to put it in my work. I try to be honest about who people are, you know, the characters, I don't demonize characters. I don't hold, put characters on pedestals. Everyone has, um, skeletons in their closet you know and and every every bad guy uh has love in their heart and and so i i think that just really investigating human beings and being um an observer in pursuit of of uh exposing the ways in which we are like yearning for one another in some way shape or form uh putting that on display and reminding people that it's okay you know, that's yeah, no, that's wow, that's gorgeous. Um, and I think too, the like that idea of you know, of being able to show all the stories all the time with everybody in them, yeah. I think is is really important, right? Like, whatever, wherever you are for, for that now. And you know, I was thinking, you know, of how like the weird thing in this pandemic moment is how you know. Houston, Colorado, and uh, and Ashland, Oregon can all be in a room together with people watching from wherever everybody else is watching from, or you know how much of you know what used to be sort of locked away in an archive is now available for us to watch, you know, after the kids go to sleep or whatever, right? And like this interesting moment that we're in, where there is such a conflict between how much access we have and what we do with the access that we have, right? Like, you know, once you learn something, you can't unlearn it. And once you see something, you can't unsee it. And so what do you do with that next? You know, I, my world has been theater for so long. And I look at so many of these theaters trying to make great changes and making great promises, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about it like like a house, right? Like there's, there's only so many walls you can tear down, right? Some of those walls are load bearing walls within the system. And, you know, theater is, you know, just one example of what we're seeing everywhere, right? So is it better to tear down the whole house and build the house you wanna build? Or can you actually build the house that you can happily live in if you can't take down that wall? And that constant question with whatever the wall is that you're running up against. And I think, you know, at least in the arts, it's a, it's a, it's a really big question for me of just sort of how, how these institutions were designed, that no matter who you put in the chair to lead, and we've seen so many gorgeous people and so many brilliant people take the chairs, but like, it's, is the chair the problem, right? Like, it doesn't matter who's in the chair. And I think, you know, the, you can look at the same question with the presidency or the Senate or, you know, newspapers or, you know, television production, like whatever your world is, law firms, like of just sort of that questioning of, you know, and again, coming back to history of understanding why it was built the way it was built, 
so that you can say, actually, that no longer serves. Um, or to say, actually, I can work with that. It's got good bones, right? <laughs> it's like, like that that question, um, I this think, is, is, a, is an important one. Yeah, this is, this is where you're talking. That's so great. This is what I love about hip hop. Uh, is that hip hop is built out of old things mm -hmm. or discard things. So, so DJ Cool Herc is, you know, is Jamaican, you know, roots, Caribbean roots, and he's playing. And so he, he takes that DJ culture that's big there and he's playing that music, but the Bronx is not really feeling that. They want the <laughs> funk. And so he goes to the James Brown records, which at that point were, you know, seven, eight years old but he's playing the breaks. They want that. They want the funk, you know? And so already you've got, you know, music made out of pieces of existing music, you know, and you've got, you know, everyone spinning on cardboard and linoleum because they were just discarded pieces of cardboard and linoleum because it's just all over the place. You look at Martha Cooper's photos, you see it like they're playing with old steel and doing flips on old mattresses. I mean, they're turning this, this post-industrial wasteland into a playground you know one my favorite picture there's a picture of like in the background there's a building on fire and there's all these adults standing below it looking up at it and then in the foreground there's like just kids playing basketball <laughs> and and and, and uh, it is the perfect kind of hgtv kind of mindset of like you flip it you just flip it like you yeah. you, you this thing's a thing like okay we, you know there's nothing wrong with the whole thing but yeah we got this we'll redo the pipes and um, to me, you were just talking about some some hip hop to me, Julie, fully stupid, or as you all as you always do. I, I think you're the first person to ever say that to me. Um, <laughs> although I, I will be adding hotten it up to like every every dramaturgical conversation I have oh, from yeah. now. On. <laughs> they know because they know when you just say you need to hotten this up. They know they know what you mean. They're like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of boring. Dr. Dr. Goodwin said so. <laughs> I got that from somebody else too. I can't even remember who told me that, but it was it was a friend of mine who didn't like teaching, and that was and he realized it because that's all he ever said. That was the feedback he gave students, and they didn't like that. He was like, "Yeah, you just I don't know, you just hotten it up." <laughs> it's like it's just kind of I don't know. It's just like you got to hotten it up. <laughs> like, what do you mean hotten it up? Yeah. What do you do with that? Yeah. Um. Can I? Can I? Okay. So we we have three minutes left. Here's here, I'm going to ask you both a question. To wrap it up, it's a quick question. And then while I'll let, let you think about it, and then I'll do like last minute housekeeping plugs, okay? So here's my question. What is the, pl what historical figure, to, to the best of your knowledge, there is no play or no film about? And I think I asked that question the wrong way. What is the play that you would want to work on about a historical figure for whom there is no existing play or film and why. Okay. While they're thinking about that, ladies and gentlemen, my name again is Idris Gilman. This is the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center. This is a, at Colorado College, this is uh, our end of our arts and social action series conversation about The Raid. If you haven't seen The Raid yet, The Raid is available at our website, fac.coloradocollege.edu backslash connect. Uh, the Raid is a digital stage reading uh, about the, the failed insurrection of John Brown at Harper's Ferry and his relationship with Frederick Douglass and others. Uh, please check it out. Uh, it runs, it's available until tomorrow morning. Tell a friend. Uh, I've been joined tonight by uh, the director of The Raid, Tiffany Nicole Green, and of course, rock star, dramaturg, the pride of Long Island, Julie Felice Dubner. Uh, Ladies, what are your answers? I don't know. Julie, do you have one? I have so many, so it's really like I, I'm at I'm at an advantage over over you probably. I think you know it's why I was just uh, I don't know if you remember Emily Ruddock from Actors Theater, sure. but sure. I was I was just uh, texting with her a couple of days ago about Frances Perkins. Um, and she was the first woman ever in uh, the government, in the, in the president's cabinet. She was the secretary mm. of labor for Franklin mm. Roosevelt. Mm. And uh, she's a fascinating person. And, and I'm sure she's appeared in some, you know, some film about, you know, Franklin and Eleanor and whoever else. And, but uh, she witnessed the Triangle Factory Fire uh, in wow. 1911, which 
is, you know, was one of the things that kicked off the modern labor movement, which Idris probably knows I'm totally obsessed with. But um, mm -hmm. the she witnessed that horrible fire where 143 uh, young people, mostly young people, mostly immigrants, mostly women, mm -hmm. were killed in a in a horrible situation. And she saw that, and it changed the trajectory of her life. Um, and she went into to this. And so she was a union person that Roosevelt hired to be as part of his New Deal. And so, I, you know, I'd hate to see a really boring biopic of her because it could be super duper crazy dry, right? Yeah. But um, I like I want someone to to do the kind of excavation, you know, to to give her a full life and a full life story. Not. I think it's a series, actually. I think it's a TV series. I think it's like you just follow her through the whole, the whole thing over many seasons. Very yeah. dope. Tiffany Nicole Green. Okay, Tulsa really used to be on my list. I don't have a person, but I have moments. So Tulsa okay. really used to be on my list um, as like a central focus, and like following that through. Um, another group, not an individual. I know that they this already exists to an extent. But I would like a Panther Party, Black Panther Party, uh, could be either a series or a play that is just like centrally focused on the Black Panther Party and the ins and outs, the details of what was going on internally and what they were fighting and, um, and a little more exposure of what the government was doing to them and the ways in which they were being targeted and what they were really up against. Not as a side plot or a B plot or part of talking about something else, but like centrally dealing with the politics of, of that and what that was. It's another series. Yeah, yeah. That's totally a series. All right, we gotta get in the TV. Um, okay, yeah, right. well, I thank you both. <laughs> thank you both for joining us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, big virtual uh, applause and uh, shower them with virtual love and appreciation. Tiffany Nicole Green, Julie Felice Dubiner, thank you all for joining us tonight on behalf of the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. We thank you. Stick around. We got lots going on, lots happening this year. Uh, keep up with us. Go to the site. Check us out uh, um, at uh, fac.coloradocollege.edu. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Be kind to each other. And we will see you next time. Peace. Thank you. Thank you.